I want to remind you of an awesome truth. The reason why Satan is such a good operator and handler of the scriptures to deceive you from seeing Jesus is because he knows the scriptures and the author of the scriptures better than anybody else. Satan knows God better than any other creature. He's the only one in our dispensation and in our lives that has ever lived with the Father, that was ever under the tutorage and the direction of the Father, and the only one that was ever given the Father's inheritance prior to us. So he knows him. He lived in his house, lived under his discipline, and was created by him. So he knows God and knows what God is doing even better than you. This is not to make you afraid of him so that you're ever conscious, but it is to let you know that his great tool is religion and that he will come in that guise. You say, how am I to look at the scriptures then? It is simply like this. You see Jesus as your all and the scriptures fall into place. You go to the scriptures without seeing Christ as all and you can be misled. We'll study this more later on when we get to this subject because we're going to spend some time on this subject. But remember, everybody has a collection of scriptures and they are biblical. Jehovah Witnesses are 100% biblical. Mormons are biblical. Christian scientism is biblical. Everybody's biblical. Everybody has scriptures. It's how they put them together, separate from Jesus Christ. That is the deceiving thing. And we'll study that more later. Now, why is it that I make such a strong, forceful statement on Jesus being the Word? Why is that so important? Well, it's important because this liberating secret, this theme of God that runs the universe hinges on the scriptures and on the word. That's really where it is locked. And the believer must unlock those scriptures to see what it is God is doing. So I want to talk to you about the biggest word to the Christ life believer scripturally. It's this word, mystery. Mystery. How does this word come about? What is the essence of the term mystery? Let's see if we can follow it to its conclusion. Before time ever began, before the foundation of the world, God said, this is the way I will create sons. I will take a part of myself and put it in the sons. To put it in the sons, I'll call it a birthing. You must be born again. So God said, I will take my own seed in a cohabitable relationship with the creature and in that relationship of love, for God so loved the world, I will place my seed in them by love, and that seed will be another person, Christ. Christ in them. Well, now that's the most revolutionary thing that's ever been said in the whole history of the universe. That has to be the most awesome thing in the universe. And as we've said again and again in this institute, everything in the universe is enforcing that one thing. <clears throat> the fact that we can live as Christians most of our life and never know it doesn't have anything to do with truth. You can live ignorant of the truth all your life. 
and honestly feel like you have truth. So what God did was to place another person, his son, called an incorruptible seed, in the creature who believed on him. Now, it's one thing for God to say that. It's another thing for him to plan it and work it out. We have studied in Institute already that God took 4,000 years of our time from the moment when he said he was going to choose us in Christ to the time that he ever did anything about it. That's a long period of time. We have no comprehension of a period like that. But he took 4,000 years before he ever did anything about it. We studied the dispensations and what their purpose was. The end result was that one night he did that thing for the first time when he himself birthed in a little girl called Mary Christ. The prototype. The example was set. Well, Jesus came forth from Mary. She gave a living Savior to a dying world. And the plan of God called for that same Jesus to finally die to fulfill the justification of God and this cross that's in the heart of God. Christ died in order that he might bring the ultimate understanding of his nature to the creature. The death of Christ. Christ rose from the grave, sent it back to heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, God sent the Holy Spirit whose purpose it was to tell the creature for the first time that Christ is in you and you're in Christ. John 14 and 20. Haven't studied that yet. We'll spend a lot of time on it. Jesus said, on that day you shall know on the day of Pentecost, you shall know that I'm in you and you're in me. The day of Pentecost came, and that's when it took place. That's when men were to know that Christ was in them. Well, how was this to happen? It happened by the coming of Jesus. When Jesus came forth, one of the first messages he ever preached after Cain of Galilee was to the ruler of the Jews. Now that's a tremendous place to start because his trouble was going to be the Jews, his brethren. They were going to kill him in the end. And so his very first important message that had to do with what runs the universe was given to the ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus. Nicodemus came as a Bible teacher wanting to talk to Jesus who was a miracle worker and Nicodemus said a great teacher and so I want to discuss things with you and right out of the clear Jesus spoke up and said to Nicodemus you must be born again or you cannot even see the kingdom of God. What an awesome statement. Just out of the clear. What was he doing? That was divine correction. We spoke of it last session. That was divine correction. There's no use us talking the Bible. There's no use us talking about Jews. There's no use talking about Israel. There's no use talking about covenants. There's no use talking about prophecy. There's no use talking about Abraham or anybody else until you're born again. You see what he did was state it right out in the open. It's a big it don't matter thing. The whole Old Testament is a big it don't matter thing until you're born again. Because that's what it leads up to. That's what the whole thing is about is the Father getting another person in you by the seed he plants. Well, of course, Nicodemus didn't understand it. And from that time on, there wasn't anybody that understood it. Now, it's got to be understood how this is going to work. How is it that he's going to get another person in the creature? How is it going to work? I'll tell you what's happened. I'll tell you how ominous the whole idea is that every one of us, the moment we were saved, had Christ placed in us. Not just a figment of the imagination, not just a spirit, not just a fantasy or an idealism. We had the Father's nature 
by the Son put in us. That's a seed. That's a person. A person who can love. Well, all the fruit of the Spirit is his personality. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, goodness. That's a person. Those are attributes of a person that was to come into us and overwhelm us and cause us to be all of those things. A person. How was it to work? How were men to understand that? I like Ron here. You heard me talk about it before. If by any stretch of the imagination, God could put me on the inside of Ron so that every time Ron opened his mouth, my voice would come out, that would indeed be strange. <laughs> that would be unbelievable. Well, that's what God was going to do because he had already figured that there was no way he could save and clean up and make right a free moral agent and still have a creature of love. So he had to do it by another. He did it. But nobody knew anything about it. They didn't understand what Jesus meant when he said you must be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand it. We talked about it before. Unbelievable answer. Jesus gave to Nicodemus when Nicodemus said, what do you mean? I'll go back in my mother's womb, come out a second time. Jesus never answered him, but he gave him a very strange answer. And he said, you, you, you feel the wind blowing, but you don't know where it's coming. You don't know where it's going. That's what it means to be born again. Crazy answer. But he wasn't to make it known. It wasn't to be explained. It wasn't something that human beings were to control. If the Father was going to birth the Son in the creature, then it had to be a private thing, a blessed thing, a holy thing. No man could touch it. No man was to have anything to do with it. So on the day of Pentecost, 120 people were filled with the Holy Spirit. But we have nothing in the scriptural record that says any of them fulfilled what Jesus said was to happen on that day. Now it may have happened, but we have nothing in the record I know of. What was to happen on that day? What was literally to take place in the upper room at Jerusalem? they were to know for the first time of any human beings on this earth that Christ was in them. They were to come to a knowing. You've always been taught, well, that's the day Jesus came to live in us by the Holy Spirit. Didn't what he said had happened. He said, you would know I'm in you. I'm in you. Well, they missed it. They talked in tongues. They had fire on their head. They had a building shaken. They had 3,000 saved. They all acted like drunk people because they were drunk on the Spirit. But there wasn't one thing said in the record about them getting what Jesus sent them there for. I preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit going on 40 years. And I've never met another preacher who said the reason you need to be filled with the Spirit is that you might know Christ is in you. And you're in Christ. Now, I'm not degrading anybody, and I don't get around much. And I don't know a lot of people. But honestly, I haven't run into writers or preachers who told me that that was a reason for the day of Pentecost. I'll go a step further. Most every one of you in this room were saved, baptized in water, maybe baptized in the Holy Ghost, maybe operated spiritual gifts. And it was some time, if not a long time, after all that happened, before you ever found out that another person lived in you. So we need to wake up 
We need to see something God's doing today. Need not be ashamed. It's what he said would happen. But the early church got into this whole thing and soul winning and changing lives became an imperative and that's what they did. And that's what many are still doing today. And that's good. But they missed the big thing God said would happen. I've studied the book of Acts. There's no mention of the purpose of Pentecost. Plenty of works, plenty of demonstrations, much of it and all of it, I suppose, of God. But they still didn't get the liberating message that runs this universe. And the day of Pentecost was the day they were to know that. Now, I said it like that because I want to help you sitting in this room because there's going to always be somebody that comes up and says, who in the world does Litzman think he is saying those things? Does he think he has something different or something new or something greater than all the rest of us? I don't know that, friend. I don't know what it is you know. But I know I preached this gospel for many years and didn't preach what Jesus said would happen. And I went to the best evangelical theological schools from Baylor University through seminary. And I never heard one word about it. And I'm not degrading anybody. I'm just telling you God's doing something today that he wants us to hear about. It's been something he's had a great problem with from the very beginning. It's been something that men in their religion didn't want to take hold of. If Satan could separate us from anything, wouldn't it be great to let the church grow up, become great, have hundreds of thousands of believers in it, and not a soul sitting there know that the thing that runs the whole universe is the Christ that's in the believer. Now, wouldn't that be a big trick play on us? That'd be the biggest joke we ever had played on us. And that's just exactly what's been going on. So one day, God made a desperate move. Most desperate move in the scriptures. The only time I ever see God break the mold of the operation of the Holy Spirit by grace in the New Testament, he did it on this day. It was a day that the one fella who had been an antagonist to the whole plan of God, the one fella that had been jailing church members and destroying Christian churches was walking down a road. God said, I got to do something about it all. So he took a look at this fella and he said, that's a guy I want on my side. So he knocked him down, struck him blind, and hollered out of heaven at him. <laughs> he really wanted him, didn't he? There's some of you that thought he did you that way, but he didn't really. He really did that to Paul. That always reminds me of an old man I dealt with in Kansas one time. I was a young fellow, whole a revival in a church. And this, this man had brought his wife every night, sat on the back seat, went to sleep, never had any interest, but he always brought his wife. And I preached two weeks and couldn't even keep him awake. Finally, the last night of the meeting, I couldn't take it any longer. He looked at a little old church and I didn't have much going on. He looked like the only sinner there. So I decided I'd work on him. And then in the altar call, I went back and put my arm around him. And I said, friend, wouldn't you like to come to Jesus? And he looked up at me just as perk as he could be. And he said, I'll come to Jesus when God treats me like he did the Apostle Paul. Well, I said, how's that? He said, if he'll knock me down, holler out of heaven and strike me blind, I'll get saved. <laughs> 
I never will forget him. And he may never forget me. Because I looked at him and I thought, my God, brother, Paul had something to give God. With no more than you got to give him, you better run to that altar. <laughs> uh, a lot of flesh in that, but uh, I never will forget what he thought about Paul's conversion. God wanted him, so he went after him. Why did he want Paul? He wanted Paul because he could go opposite perfect. We'll talk about this later on one of our theological subjects. But you know what makes good believers? Good sinners. Why? God's no greater in you than your reflection of him as a vessel. You make a sorry reflection of him, that's what he is. That's what God is where you go. And I've always noticed sorry sinners make sorry church members. Sinners don't pay their bill, make church members don't pay their bills. The reason why is God uses what he has. And I think God took a look at him and said, that fellow's really on the ball against me. I'd like to get him for me. So he went after Paul. History of Paul. What a glorious story it is. Well, Paul got saved right there because he looked up and said, Lord, what do you have me to do? And the Lord said, you go into the city and it'll be told you what to do. Some days later, Ananias laid hands on him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and his sight returned and he started preaching the gospel. Maybe he preached the gospel a year, two years, three years. Don't know how long he preached it. But things began to well up in him. Something was needed in his life. Saved, filled with the Holy Spirit when Ananias laid hands on him. Had a mark, remarkable healing. Preaching the gospel. Lives were changed. But there was something missing in him. He went over to Jerusalem, met Peter, James, and John, and they had no answers for him. We'll talk about that later, too. But what he did, finally, was to get along with God. And a remarkable thing happened to him when he did in Galatians 1, 15, 16, 17. It says, God revealed his son in him. That's the first time any creature outside of the Virgin Mary ever made reference or had reference made to them that the one big thing God was doing in the universe had happened. Wars don't matter. Inventions don't matter. Civilizations don't matter. Human beings without Christ don't matter. What really mattered that day was that God said to the first creature we've written record of that the one thing that runs the universe for which I created the, created the whole world has taken place. I have put another in you and I'm telling you about it. They should have known it on the day of Pentecost, but they missed it. Just like multitudes today miss it who are spirit-filled even. They miss it. We'll discuss all that later to a fine point. If any of that bothers you, we'll go through it again in this institute. But what I'm really getting at is when he saw what it was to be born again, he realized that mortals couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle another father rebirthing another son in the creature. So he did an unbelievable thing. The Apostle Paul never used the term born again. Now that always bothered me because you know any good Baptist has got to preach that in every sermon. 
But Paul never mentioned born again. Now that always bothered me. Why didn't he mention it? Because he sensed something right off that you can get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit and do great and mighty works and still not know what God's doing. Why? Separated. Separated in understanding. You had the work. You're really saved. There's really been birthed in you another person. You really have the Holy Spirit teaching you. But you're so separated in your thinking, you can't grasp what it is the Holy Spirit is saying, what this book is saying, or what it is that happened to you. Well, this is what Paul did. He never used the term born again, but what he did use, and he used it liberally, was this word, mystery. What he said was now that God has put another person in the creature, and that's a mystery. Why did he treat it like that? Well, I guess he knew everybody loves a mystery. But there was another reason. Mysteries, to be understood, must be explained by somebody outside of yourself. That's a definition of mystery, explained by something or somebody. That's what Paul came up with. He said, you're not going to know this great thing's happened to you within yourself. It's happened to you, but you don't know it. He said, it's a mystery, and the mystery must be revealed. Revealed by the Spirit. Ephesians 1 and 17, I'm praying for you that you might have the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of Him. What is a mystery? A mystery to be understood must have revelation. There must be a revelation. Well, this is what Paul got a hold of. That's why his whole terminology revolves around it. You've read your Bible scores of times, and you've heard him say that, but maybe you didn't understand what he was getting to. He's getting to the fact that there's one thing that runs the universe, that men were chosen by God to be possessed of Christ before the foundation of the world, and anything that's happened in the world has nothing to do with that except to explain it. But men haven't gotten the message. So now he has sent the Holy Spirit to reveal to them that another's in them. That's the mystery. That's why he calls it a mystery and treats it as such. The whole plan of God is an unfolding mystery because it was never God's intention that natural men understand what it was he was doing or how he would do it. Now, I've got to digress a moment because I know something happened to you. Many of you have been raised like I to believe that it's a simple gospel. But you've probably been at it long enough to know that a simple gospel makes simple believers too. And the end result is we never come to the understanding of what God really has for us. It's like the salesman who tells you that the, the uh, personal computer you're getting could be run by a four-year-old child. That's tremendous sales talk. So you buy it thinking, well, I'm at least that smart, only to find out you sure got to learn some other things. That's the way the gospel is. Very simple to get into. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But to make that operate properly and to come into the conclusion and understanding of what God's intention was cost you your whole life. It'll cost you your whole life. But until you begin to grow in that and come to the stature of that, you have no peace. Religion is an albatross around your neck. There's no hope, there's no peace without it. 
so it's got to be revealed. It is a mystery to be revealed. And we're going to explore that thoroughly in the next institute and finishing up this evening. Turn with me to Romans 16. <coughs> Romans 16, verse 25. Please mark it heavy. In fact, all of these verses we're going to discuss in this subject of the mystery need to be marked heavily in your Bibles because they're a key to the scripture. Every time you read the word mystery, you're reading about the born again experience brought by another father. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret before the world began. Now there's no way I can just read that verse. We've got to go through it and firmly establish the truth that is there. Now to the Holy Spirit who has the power to establish you according to my gospel. The Holy Spirit is the establisher. He's the sealer. He's the teacher. Now to the Holy Spirit who can do that according to my gospel. Underline my gospel. Why? We're going to see that the Apostle Paul had to call it his gospel because the erroneous gospel separated from the mystery was preached by good brethren in his day and he had to make a distinction. He made this distinction three or four times in the book of Romans alone as he calls it my gospel. What was his gospel based on? The revelation he had received of Christ in him. In his day, no one else was teaching and preaching that like him. Why? He was the first man to receive the revelation of another person in you. And so he didn't want these believers to think, now I'm preaching the same thing all these full gospel charismatic Baptist preachers over here are preaching. I want it known. It's according to my gospel. He is not egotistical. It isn't pride. It is a separation of the erroneous gospel that kept men separated from the Christ that was in them. And so he calls it his gospel. We'll run across it several more times yet. I want to establish you according to my gospel, he said, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. What does the line mean? It means that I will not preach Jesus Christ separated from the revelation of the mystery. We're going to get real heavy into the revelation theme later on. But I want to pause and ask you something. You've had a lot of things preached to you in a lifetime. Sometimes they preached you need to be sanctified. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You need to get right with God. You need to make a commitment. You need to stop being backslidden and get in here right with God before you go to hell. You've had all kinds of things told you you needed to do. Did you ever have anybody who preached to you say that I want you to have a revelation according to the mystery of the gospel. What is a revelation? That's a knowing thing to the mind. I want you to have an experience where you have received from the Holy Spirit a knowledge of the mystery of the gospel. You've prayed for a lot of things. Did you ever pray, God, <coughs> reveal the mystery to me? You say, why should I do that, brother? I've already experienced it. I don't believe that. 
because I don't think you know what it is. Not just you, but anybody. I don't believe we possess anything really that we're ignorant of. You've had Christ in you ever since you've been saved. But if you don't know that, you're not going to live that. You're not going to walk that. You're not going to talk that. You can heap every experience you want on you. But until it is revealed to you that Christ is in you, you're not going to talk and live Christ. I know I didn't. Oh, you'll try to be a good Christian. You'll be a good Christian some days. You'll be real nice sometimes. But until you know there's another person in you, you're not going to be jerked up by that. You're not going to go out and get in your car in the morning and say, Father, here's Jesus in my form going to work. Because you don't know that. But that's what it is. It isn't you that lives at all. You've already said it hundreds of times. I no longer live. Christ liveth in me. But you don't believe it. You don't live it. You get on the job. You make a deal. You don't say to the fellow you're dealing with, well, the Lord made a good deal here, didn't he? You don't believe that. You say, well, I did. I did it. No. Oh, you've been saying spiritually you no longer live. How could you did it? You didn't. It was him. You don't know that. We don't know how to live Christ. We know how to live like Christians. So we got shelves of books telling us how to live like Jesus. And you don't go pick one up now when you're discouraged because it's baloney. You've already failed at that. You already can't make it work. Some of you could write a book on marriage, but still can't make it work. We got a whole lot of information in us, but we don't have that ultimate final information that it's him. It's him. It's him. Somehow we don't see it in the scriptures. And this 25th verse is an explosive first verse to begin with on the mystery because Paul says in the last line that God hid this thing. He's hidden this thing from Adam through Malachi. He's hidden this thing from Adam to John the Baptist. Better than that, he's hidden this thing from Adam to me. That takes in that whole gang on the day of Pentecost. They didn't see it. Just like multitudes today don't see it. Who's sitting in this room? Big God the Father. Up there somewhere. He is up there somewhere. Not Jesus. The Father. Who's birthed every one of us and put in every one of us the same seed, because our Father only has one kind of seed. Only one Christ, and He's in every one of us. You know what He sees in this room tonight? He doesn't see Mark, and Ruby, and Robbie, and Ernie. You know what He sees? One son. One son. That's all he sees here. You say, aren't we distinctive? Yep, like flowers. We're all different. But there's only one life in us. Just one son. We don't see that. We don't see the one son in this room. Because the mystery has got to be revealed must be revealed. It isn't you that's going to get up and walk out of this room. It's Christ in your form, in a human form. It isn't you that's going to go start the car. It's Christ in a human form. It isn't you that'll go to bed. It's Christ in a human form. In you. But you don't live like that. 
Some of you lot will have a fight with the husband before you get home tonight. You're not living like that. You're going to jump all over the kids when you get in tonight. We don't live like that. We don't know that, so we can't live it. You say, oh, I don't believe God would do that. That verse says he did it for 4,000 years. He hid it. He hid it. We're going to see him say that three more times in different kinds of words that mean the same thing, that God hid this thing. One time he's going to call it a big secret. Yep, a big secret. I'm only going to let a few of them know about it. Well, you see, the mystery really gripped Paul over 20 times. He called the born-again experience a mystery because it's got to be revealed or else it's hidden. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, well, what about all these people that don't know that? Doesn't God love them? Sure he does. He's already birthed his son in them. Well, what does that mean? Two times the apostle gives us the answer. Both times, scriptures, nearly the same. Two different epistles. It goes like this. On the resurrection morning, when they see him. Remember that? When the believer sees him, they shall know they're like him. They'll know it. Well, praise God for that. If I hadn't had a revelation of Jesus, I'd have found it out in the end. A fellow said to me one time, said, well, why do we have to go through all this? Why are we sitting in the institute? Why am I going to church all the time paying tithes? If I'm born again and I'm going to be like him in the end, why go through all of this? I said, it's simple. I couldn't help falling in love. Along the way, I've discovered Christ in me. As a wife, believer, I've discovered my Jesus husband. And I've fallen in love with him. How did I fall in love with him? As we said in this institute, by the CNS gang, they worked on me, manipulated me, shoved me around, Circumstances and situations, my classrooms, fixed me so that one day I said, he's my answer. He's my all. And he's not up there. He's not over there. He's not sitting on the steeple. He's not locked up in the hymn book nor hiding in the organ. He's in me. He's in me. And I said, if I'm going to have a love affair, I've got to have it with him. Here and now, him. Are you hearing me? I happen to fall in love. I don't have to do this to be saved. I don't have to go from one end of the country to another every month to be proven I'm a good Christian or sanctified or righteous. I know now I couldn't stand before God any more perfect than I am because I stand in the person of Jesus. Then why in the world are you doing what you do? Along the way, I fell in love. I love him. You don't have to ask me to give. I love him. You don't have to ask me to go. I love him. You don't have to ask me to teach. I'll do that at the drop of the hat. I love him. I fell in love. Boy, I don't want to wait till the resurrection morning. I'm in love now. I want something to happen now. Amen. I want us to be one now. Sure, it's going to all work out then. But notice what Paul said. Even then, it is by seeing him. When we see him, we shall be changed, and we shall be like him. Oh, I know that means resurrection. But you've got to see him. You're not going to have resurrection without seeing him. And you're not going to have the revelation of the mystery 
without seeing him. And that's why I keep telling you, the scriptures won't help you unless you see him in them. That's what Jesus said to the Jews. They testify of me, but you didn't see them. You didn't see me. Well, here it is. We're getting down to the nitty gritty of the Christ life now. It's a mystery. There's no two ways about it. You've had him in you ever since you were saved. I don't care if by confirmation, counting beads, being baptized, joining the church, or talking in tongues. I don't care how you got it. He's there. Because the Father cohabitated with you in an act of love and placed his own dear son in you. Now, whether you know it or not, doesn't matter. Whether you come to the understanding of it doesn't matter. But it happened because that's the only kind of salvation God has. By another and by that other in you. Now, how are you going to come to find out about it? How are you going to come to know this? You can only come to know it by a revelation. The mystery must be revealed. Now, it's like this. No man can teach you Christ. You ever wonder why Paul said that? No man can teach you Christ. I couldn't teach you Christ. I couldn't teach you these things I'm talking to you about now if my life depended on it. Why, we've got folks that's been in institute with me three years who still don't understand anything. I couldn't teach them a thing. But I'll tell you periodically along the way that the Holy Spirit will take the things we've talked about and bring them to your understanding. Because you're not going to know the mystery till the Spirit reveals it to you. Because God will hide it from you till the love affair takes hold. You're not going to go any deeper with God until the love affair takes hold. Oh, you say, bless God, he's going to use me. He can use you, and you still not know him. We went through that in Matthew 7 tonight. You say, well, I want to perform miracles. You can do that and still not know him. How are you going to know him? You love him. Do you love him? Do you have any sense of love for the Jesus that is in you? Do you love him enough that you'd give him a clean body to live in? A clean mind to use? Because he has no mind but yours. That's how he just kind of leaks out of some believers. They got such a dirty mind, he can't use it. He's not going to flow out of your body. Even though it's a sinful body that'll never be saved. It doesn't have to be a sinning body. We'll deal with that thoroughly in Romans 7. It doesn't have to be a sinning body. It can be free of sin, though its tendency is never to be saved, never to be made righteous. He'd like to have you in a love affair. I'm not going to argue with you that you can live in some sin and get along. You tell me you're saved, I'm going to accept that. Praise God. I'm not going to argue with you over what's right and what's wrong, where you go or where you don't go, and how you smell or what you look like. But I'm going to tell you, if you ever form a love affair with the Christ that's in you. Now, notice how different this is. You can come to me as a pastor and say, you know, Pastor, I love Jesus more than anything in all this world. I don't care what you think. I love him more than anything in all this world. That's because you're so separated from him. You really believe that. But if I could ever get you conscious that he's on the inside of you, and you tell me you love him more than anything in all the world, that'll radically change your walk and your talk and your living. Oh, that's different. That's the mystery. And once it's revealed, nobody will have to jump on you to live honest, to do what's right.
to not sin. Nobody will have to tell you these things because you've got a love affair going and everywhere I go, it's Him. Everything I do, it's Him. Everything I say, it's Him. The only life I have is Him. That was the mystery. That's why Paul calls it a mystery. That goes so deep beyond comprehension that you either see that by the teaching of the Holy Spirit or you get involved with religion that tries to explain it. No man can explain that to you. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. So you see, this is a pretty rich verse because God has kept this thing secret since the world begun. But look at verse 26 now. Now, circle that now. When is now? Right now. When is this now? Right now. Now. This is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Right now when you read this, this is made known to you. But notice what he incorporates in this 26th verse. He says that in the scriptures of the prophets, this was said again and again by the scriptures of the prophets, this was said. How was it said? By commandment of the everlasting God. How was it said? Look at Isaiah. He's the most prolific probably. He's just talking along in verse after verse and talks about Christ being in you. Christ being all. God's Son being our life. Why, you never saw that. I taught Isaiah in college and never saw it. We never saw that. But you know what was going on? God had commanded Isaiah to say this liberating secret that Christ would be the only life of the human being. He commanded that. Everybody that prophesied said that. We've got thousands of books written on Old Testament prophecy. But I can't recall a one that took the prophecies where God commanded that the liberating secret be stated in closure terms or hidden terms our secret words and make it known to us because man doesn't see that. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But Paul says, even though it was kept secret, God got the message out and later on, we'll look into some of those messages how God said thoroughly that the only life there would be in the creature that was his would be the life of his dear son. Now he wants to make that manifest. You know what, dear friends? The tendency of people is to argue and to fuss and to rant and to rave over the way I said something, and I don't always say it right. But that's a tendency, and that's a subtle form of separation. Because the biggest thing I have to tell you is that the mystery of godliness is Christ in you. Your only hope of glory. Glory means eternal plan of God in operation. Your only hope of knowing the kingdom of God and the eternal plan of God is by the Spirit revealing the Son in you. Now that's what is necessary. Whatever else I may say and whatever else may not fit together for you, what is important is that you know this. So don't let Satan steal that from you by a very subtle religious act. If I'm right in what I talk to you about, then I am so radical to your life that you're going to have to do something about it. 
I mean, it'll be a radical thing you do. You won't tolerate any other kind of religion, any other kind of preaching. You'll get mad and angry at a point thinking, how could I have lived all these years in a good gospel church that gets souls out of hell and into heaven and not know this liberating secret? How could that happen to me? You'll get angry. you get mad at preachers. Somebody wrote us the other day, said they're so mad at preachers they didn't know what to do. We wrote them back and said, love them. That's what you do when you get mad at preachers. You love them. <coughs> if I'm right, if at all I'm right, the most radical thing that'll ever happen to you faces you now. Because it has to do with your thinking, with all your relationship, with eternity, with your work, with what's in front of you right now. It has to do with all of it. If I'm wrong, if I'm even the least bit wrong, throw it out. Throw it out. Or set it on the shelf. Forget it. If you can leave it alone, if you can put it on a shelf and never go back to it, great. But if I'm right, you can't get rid of it. Because it's radical enough to change your life. Because if there's really been birthed in you another person, He's in you right now. And you don't know it until the revelation of this mystery comes to your mind by the Holy Spirit. Now that's the nitty gritty of the Christ life. Don't feel badly because Brother Peter didn't know this before Paul got a hold of him. James didn't know it. John didn't know it. And we'll study that later because the scripture is clear on it. So don't feel badly that you don't know it. But now, if the Spirit brings it to you, you gotta do something with it. And if you can't get rid of it and it keeps coming back, that's his call. That's his call to you out of love because he does love you. And if you fall in love with him, you're gonna do something about it. You're going to be the Christ he intended that you be by the Son that lives in you.